second last presentation of the uh, lecture series on sustainability in computer science. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Kaspar Lieblock from the University of Vienna. Um, Kaspar, you have a great title, Harnessing Untapped Potentials in the Internet of Things, Retrofitting and Upgradability. And I'm pretty sure that it will be as exciting as all the other presentations. Kaspar, it's your floor. Thank you very much. Uh, warm welcome from my side as well. Um, yes, as you've already heard, my, the title of my presentation of my uh, lecture today is Harnessing the Untapped Potentials in the Internet of Things. And we're going to have a special focus here on retrofitting and upgradability. Um, yeah, right. My name is Kaspar Liebloch. I'm a university assistant, pre-doc, and a PhD student at the University of Vienna, specifically at the Faculty of Computer Science at the research group Cooperative Systems. You can reach me via this email address for a few months uh, if you uh, want to talk further about the topic that I presented to you today. Um, so my talk uh, is going to be about contributions of computer science in the avoidance of e-waste today and on how to enable long-term usage of IoT-enabled household appliances, just to preface that. Um, this is our roadmap for today. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal uh, number 12, which is called Responsible Production and Consumption. Uh, then uh, I'll tell you a little bit about product obsolescence and the legal framework in the European Union. Um, then we'll look at domain-specific challenges of IoT retrofitting, uh, which is going to be a very practical uh, chapter of this presentation. Uh, I'll then present you with uh, Serial IoT or Serial IoT, which is an interface for upgradability by default. And in the end, I'll just make a few statements towards uh, what we like to call a right to improve. But first up, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goal number 12, Responsible Production and Consumption. Um, I'm pretty sure, I hope, I assume that most of you have seen this graphic uh, in the past semester at least a few times. These are the sustainable development goals that the United Nations have committed themselves to reaching. I think the time frame, the goal was to do that by 2030. Uh, we are halfway there in terms of time because the goals have been decided on in 2015. And I don't think we are halfway there when it comes to reaching uh, each of these goals. Um, they do all have different domains, uh, societal domains or environmental domains, uh, or even social domains. Uh, so they all concern different, uh, different topics, if you will. Um, today, we are most interested in the goal number 12, which is called Responsible Consumption and Production. And this goal itself consists uh, of 11 targets, which have been defined for this, uh, this goal. Um, I'm not going to explain each and every one of those to you, but just the one that is most relevant to us, which is the target 12.5. And it reads, by 2030, substantially reduce waste generation through prevention, reduction, recycling, and reuse. Um, and to put this uh, into perspective, um, especially our perspective as computer scientists, because that's probably the kind of waste we are at least most familiar with and also in our, yeah, in our domain, maybe a bit responsible for um, e-waste. And the report from 2020 uh, told us, uh, from the United Nations, told us that uh, in 2000, 2019, the amount of e-waste generated per person uh, was about 7.3 kilograms uh, per year. Uh, and only a small part, small amount of that was uh, dealt with in an um, environmentally sustainable manner, meaning uh, being recycled in a sustainable manner. And to make matters worse, um, the generation of e-waste is expected to grow uh, until 2030 uh, to eventually reach uh, 9 kilograms per capita in 2030. So we are very much not on track to uh, reaching this uh, goal we have set well, the United Nations has United Nations have uh, set for us uh, in regards to, uh, with regards to the e-waste genera uh, generation that we are currently uh, having. So, uh, what can we do in order to minimize uh, e-waste? Uh, and what were what were the the main keywords from the goal uh, itself? Uh, the, the terms prevention, reduction, recycling, and reuse. 
how do we prevent uh, waste, e-waste? Uh, we design for durability. And that works uh, either by making stuff very durable in the first place or by favoring repair over replacement. We also can do that in design. But we also, as consumers, we are kind of responsible for this topic. Uh, we can favor repair over replacement in use. So we can decide to repair appliances instead of replacing them, uh, even though that might be not exactly what we want to do in the moment. Um, we could also think beyond repair. So if an appliance does not fulfill uh, the, the necessity, uh, the, yeah, the, uh, does not fulfill the requirements we had for it anymore, uh, we could think about improving it. And there are two terms come to mind, upgrading it with novel technology or retrofitting it with uh, novel technology, which means upgrading usually says that there's at least an interface there to do some upgrading and retrofitting is probably done after the fact without uh, the upgrade having been uh, anticipated by the appliance itself. Uh, and well, in addition to improving, we can also anticipate and encourage repurposing of appliances, of devices. Um, how are these goals currently enforced? Well, this brings us to point two on our agenda today. Um, product obsolescence and the legal framework in the European Union. So how does the European Union enforce reaching these goals, especially for e-waste uh, and with our specific scope focus for today, especially for household appliances? Okay, first of all, uh, I want to establish the term of product obsolescence, especially in household appliances. Um, the term obsolescence is nothing but the process or fact of becoming obsolete or outdated or of falling into disuse per the Oxford Dictionary. Um, bad news is product obsolescence is inevitable. So uh, nothing can be made to last forever. Um, this has in part to do with the durability of materials and the durability of parts, of designs. Um, it has in part to do with technological advancements in terms of safety, in terms of efficiency or of features. That means uh, stuff just gets better as we technologically advance. And sooner or later, uh, old stuff is just from a current perspective way too unsafe to use anymore. And then uh, it becomes obsolete uh, and we have to replace it. This can also in part be rooted in fashion. So if we think about uh, the product cycle of uh, mobile phones, for example, um, there's some, a part of it maybe uh, be rooted in fashion and devices go obsolete just because they fall out of fashion in a way. Um, so if we establish that product obsolescence is in its core inevitable, um, we can start to think to design for obsolescence um, because we want to use resources efficiently. And it is a common design paradigm to make an appliance last as long as the weakest part of it. So make every part as weak as the weakest part in order to conserve resources uh, instead of over-engineering different parts, uh, which are then well going to waste because the weakest part broke. Also, a topic of discussion is often planned obsolescence, which is premature failure due to deliberate design flaws. So someone actively decided to make a part weak uh, for the appliance to fail early and to generate more revenue. Um, this is out of scope for today, um, but we do very much acknowledge it. And I don't think it really does happen as often as we think it does. And there's a new phenomenon on the horizon, which is especially relevant to us as computer scientists, which is software-based obsolescence. And usually this boils down to a lack of security updates or maybe bad firmware updates that brick a device uh, or, well, connectivity issues. Uh, there's a lot to think uh, of there. Um, if we talk about obsolescence, uh, we often get presented with a buzzword or uh, with a graphics, uh, with a graphic which is the so-called bathtub curve of uh, device failure over time or device failure rate over time. So what you see here is a model which represents the rate of failure of an appliance over the time it is in use. But this is not just for an appliance, but for like a model. So if you say this is dishwasher number four from Siemens, from Bosch, uh, you see in the beginning, um, 
there's a lot of failures because we have bad manufacturing samples, which um, well, which do have those uh, early failures. After a while, those get weeded out, and we enter the. Oh, maybe I can, I can enable the laser pointer, and we enter well, the valley of where everything works well. That means the first forty units have been pulled out of uh, pulled out of the market. Uh, everything works pretty well, and after a while. Uh, well, the incidence of failure increases again. Uh, parts wear out. Mm, yeah, parts wear out. Materials wear out. And in the end, the failure rate increases a lot. And this is the point where a whole model series reaches obsolescence then probably. Okay, so, so much about obsolescence. Um, how does the legal framework in the European Union look like? Uh, with regards to product obsolescence, to how products we use in our households are designed. Well, um, I'm trying to, well, I tried to present this to you on like uh, a timeline, which starts at the inception of a device. So the point in time where an engineer, a company has the idea of producing a new uh, appliance. And in between the inception of a device and the time it enters the market, uh, there's one important directive from the European Union that applies to the design of uh, this product. It's the so-called Eco Design Directive. And it has a few mandates. It, it does mandate a bit about how the product has to be designed, especially in terms of resource consumption, think water or electricity, uh, and also in terms of um, uh, repairability, but it's more like not really repairability, but uh, replacement part availability and stuff. So this is the Eco Design Directive. It mostly applies to 11 categories of products which have been listed out. And these are like the most common big household devices you own, dishwasher, washing machine, refrigerators, uh, but also to welding equipment and servers. So after this Eco Design Directive has mandated how to design a product, uh, the device is being produced and it enters the market. And then you as a consumer are protected by the sale of goods directive, which entitles you to a replacement once your device fails with the vendor you've bought it from. So the vendor has to give you some sort of a vendor's warranty for two years uh, and promises that your device works well. If it doesn't, uh, you can return it. You maybe get your money back. You maybe get a replacement. You maybe get a repair. And then there's a long time of nothing because assumedly everything works fine. And once the device physically fails, there's an upcoming right to repair in the European Union, which has been presented, I think, about a year ago, but it's uh, in between Commission and Parliament. And it's supposed to be also a directive. And what it does is, is uh, it entitles you as a consumer to uh, receiving repair service for your appliances. Um, Yes, so if we uh, overlay the bathtub curve with this legal framework in the European Union, you see that it's more or less designed to save you from the early failures of uh, the early occurrences of obsolescence of a product. Uh, and also in the end, when there's increasing uh, problems with the product, you're also getting help uh, by being entitled to uh, repair services. So far, the legal framework and obsolescence or product obsolescence. Uh, there's a few takeaways here. Um, obsolescence is inevitable. I can just repeat that. And it can be modeled with the bathtub curve. The Eco Design Directive mandates parameters for uh, appliance design, and it applies to specific product categories only. The Sale of Goods Directive protects you for two years after a sale and concerns vendors, not manufacturers. And the right to repairs yet to come and will apply to the Eco Design Directive categories. So you can't demand repair for any uh, appliance you own. And uh, it does entitle you to repair service. OK, so I just wanted to like put some background into uh, what else is going to come today. Um, so uh, we have established some in a way that the legal framework had, handles uh, product obsolescence in the European Union. Uh, and the question we are going to tackle today is uh, how can computer science contribute beyond that? And I mentioned two words already, retrofitting and upgrading. And first, we're going to take a closer look at retrofitting and in particular, 
uh, in retrofitting for the Internet of Things. So uh, we're taking a closer look on domain-specific challenges of IoT retrofitting. Um, but before we delve into these challenges, uh, I'll introduce the residential Internet of Things. Um, I found a very neat definition for the Internet of Things on the homepage of Oracle. <laughs> uh, and I like that because it incorporates, I think, a few views that are important. Uh, I just read it out to you. Uh, the network, uh, the Internet of Things is a network of physical objects, things called things, that are embedded with sensors, software, and other technologies for the purpose of connecting and ex exchanging data with other devices and systems over the Internet. Uh, Interesting in this talk is the residential Internet of Things that we often call the smart home, which are smart household appliances that can be used for remote control and remote monitoring, um, that can be used for home automation, which in turn enables uh, efficient use of energy resources if you have uh, energy production at home. There's a lot of competing standards in this sector. There's a lot of competing manufacturers in this sector which all want to lure you into their ecosystems. And there's very selective cross integrations in this sector. So not every vendor, not every manufacturer is willing to enable interoperability with other vendors or other uh, ecosystems. And well, there's a few rampant examples of uh, Internet of Things, things not working together the way they could. Okay, so what is IoT retrofitting and why do we do it? Um, what we define as IoT retrofitting is outfitting existing uh, appliances with IoT technology. Um, those appliances don't necessarily have to be uh, prepared for that act. Um, we outfit them with network modules, with sensors, with actuators. Um, so far, so until my, my research more or less, this is academically mostly observed in the industrial context, um, in fabrication machinery, which is uh, well, retrofitted to become industry 4.0, another buzzword, uh, because appliances, they are a significant investment and it makes sense from an, from an economic perspective to keep them in operation for as long as possible uh, because it saves you money instead of replacing uh, these uh, yeah, fabrication machineries. So delaying obsolescence is a very, very big motivator. And there is also consumer grade IoT retrofitting, which is not that well represented in uh, scientific literature. But if you go on GitHub, you find uh, a plethora of projects from private persons who did uh, a custom IoT retrofit or a hack on a household appliance. What unites uh, the retrofitting approaches is that they have the same goal. They want to prolong the loose use phase uh, of an appliance as opposed to replacing it with a new, with a smart one, which is in turn prolonging the time until obsolescence of the product we use. Um, what we did is uh, we wanted to look at the, a few domain-specific challenges of IoT retrofitting, and for that we made uh, we conducted three case studies. And the domains we chose were the physical domain, the electronic domain, and the digital domain. That means um, we tried retrofitting projects in each of these domains. Uh, the preconditions for the case studies was that the test subject is always just a motivated computer scientist or a developer, but not a domain expert. So. We didn't have a robotics expert doing physical retrofitting. We didn't have an electrical engineer doing electronic retrofitting. And well, okay, for the digital retrofitting process, maybe the developer is even a domain expert, if you if you will. Uh, we did that uh, via autoethnography. That means just documenting the process minutiously. Uh, one project was done uh, by myself. One was supervised, and one is online sourced uh, from a very very well documented uh, uh, project. And uh, this, this approach, of course, comes with a few limitations. Um, the challenges that we discovered are only the ones we identified for the target de demographic. So there may be uh, many more challenges. And at the same time, uh, the online sourced autoethnography, while we could check that the result, the, the product that came out in the end does work, we could not verify whether the process has been documented correctly. Still, uh, we wanted to look at uh, these three domains. And the first one, the physical retrofitting domain, um, that works on physical user interface components. So that may be buttons, that may be levers, that may be knobs, that may be gears. And the target for our project was this uh, heating control panel, 
uh, with the motivation to conserve energy because the heating in our office building here uh, turns on at 7 a.m. when nobody is in the office and uh, it turns off at 8 p.m. when there's few people in the office or at least not every room is still occupied. So we wanted to fix the inefficient programming and for that we had to IoT retrofit uh, this control panel. And we thought, well, let's do that uh, on a physical path. Um, so first of all, uh, I introduced the retrofitting processes as a list of steps. And the first step for this IoT retrofitting, uh, physical retrofitting project was we needed to analyze the interface and see what does it, of what, what does it offer us uh, for a retrofitting project. And uh, you could see that there's a temperature setting, which tells us the temperature it is set to. Uh, there's temperature controls for well, setting the temperature up or down. There's a power button and also there's a status LED, which tells us whether the appliance is on or off. Uh, once those interface elements were identified, we reduced those to the necessary elements, which are just turning it on or off, and also looking whether it is on or off. Because uh, with that, we can regulate the temperature by turning it off and on up until the point that is set uh, up here, so the 22 degrees in our case. Uh, we started this project uh, uh, at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, uh, where the motivation to conserve energy by any means possible was uh, very high. Um, all right, once we established what the necessary elements are, uh, we had to find compatible hardware, meaning what can we use to push the button? How do we measure temperature instead of the thermostat that is there? Uh, how do we check whether the, uh, whether the LED, the status LED is on? And how do we control it uh, via the internet? And for that, we use a photoresistor uh, in combination with the resistor as a voltage divider to measure the light that comes out of the, uh, of the LED. We use a temperature sensor for the temperature. Uh, we use a switch bot, which is a Bluetooth actuator that can push, that, yeah, that can push buttons. Uh, you'll see this later. Uh, and an ESP microcontroller, which more or less connects all of these components together. Then we build a custom solution. In our case, we used Home Assistant, which is a popular uh, smart home uh, IoT middleware, uh, let's call it, and ESP Home, which is uh, another project in combination with Home Assistant, which enables easy configuration of uh, microcontrollers uh, of the ESP kind. Um, we build a custom solution, both in hardware and software. And uh, in the end, we have a complex prototype consisting of multiple interlinked hardware components. And I don't know whether you've just seen that, I Probably restart the video if you need it, if, if you want to see it again, if I can. But uh, the little white box uh, did push out an arm that pushed the button, the on-off button on our thermostat. Maybe now you can see it again. We push, a, uh, yeah, we push a button on the smartphone, and a short while later, there's a small white arm that pushes the button on the thermostat, and the heating turns off. This is great and helps us conserve a lot of energy because. Uh, well, we're scientists, we're computer scientists. We don't really get to office before 11. And uh, that's why we save at least almost a quarter of the time that the heating would be running otherwise. Okay, so much for the physical retrofitting. Um, what were the challenges? Well, first of all, uh, it's complex and you require a creative cross-domain approach to solve this problem of different interaction possibilities and measuring different, in part, analog, is, uh, analog values. Um, so you require different, multiple different hardware and software components. It also has functional impact. In our case, it's pretty fine. You can still push the button, but uh, imagine other, some call those smart sleeves. Um, they may obstruct the original user interface. And it also has an aesthetic impact and impairs the appearance of the appliance. I personally like the googly eyes, but some might not. And also uh, the solution is very specific and it has to be specifically fitted to every appliance uh, you use it on. So it's not at all functionally generic. Um, next up is our second case study, the electronic IoT retrofitting. Um, we did this on a coffee machine. What is an electronic interface we, we want to retrofit? Well, these are electrical contacts. This is interception of voltages, which go from one point to another. And we kind of want to either 
measure those and get information out or emulate them in order to start and trigger specific processes in the machine. Our target was this espresso maker um, and we wanted to extend its feature set and thus delay its obsolescence. Um, this is a very important disclaimer. I'm always delivering a lot of disclaimers. Don't try this at home in theory or in practice. In such a machine, there's also high voltage lines, uh, which can be dangerous. Uh, we know what we're doing. Please don't do this unless you know what you are doing. Um, what were the steps? So <laughs> I, I got reminded today when I practiced this talk that even though this looks like a step-by-step -step manual on how to do this, please don't do this. This is not a manual. This is just documentations of the steps we did. Okay. So our steps still were, uh, first of all, we had to find a suitable entry point for our intercepting device to sit in. And we identified the low voltage front panel cable that ran from the front panel where you push your button to get your coffee back to the main board where you, uh, well, where the machine does everything to control the motors and the heating elements and uh, what have you, the pump in order to brew your coffee. So this is basically uh, over this cable, runs all the input that users can give it from the front panel. So we can just harness that. Um, next up is you have to measure, we had to measure and document the electronic signals. And for that, we built a makeshift uh, Y cable and interceptor, uh, which was then connected to some electrical probes, which were connected to a logic analyzer. Uh, with this way, we can document, measure all of the different signals that are sent from the front panel to the main board and back. And we can try to emulate those later. Once we have measured those signals and documented them, uh, we need to reverse engineer the meaning of those signals. That means uh, we now have in our software from our logic analyzer, a lot of voltages which oscillate between high and low. And we have to, well, push the button, see what happens in the logic analyzer and then find the correct point in time. And mind you, this is just a few microseconds. Um, where we, where the button push is transported from the control panel back to the main board. So in this case, a single espresso button has been pressed uh, and we want to extract it. And then we need to know uh, where exactly in the pattern uh, once synchronized, uh, this one pin has to be set to high in order to uh, trigger uh, the process of brewing an espresso. Um, next step is reproducing those electronic signals. Well, you do that in code on an ESP microcontroller, which can just uh, well, set voltages on pins high or low. Um, we did that with, our, with uh, the Arduino IDE. And in the end, we built a custom software solution, which does not only inject those electric signals into the wire, but also uh, has an HTTP server. So you can just send requests there in order to get your coffee. Um, what is the result? Well, a software prototype for ESP microcontrollers. And you can see here, unfortunately, this is not a video. This is not moving. Uh, the laptop located on top of the machine uh, with the button recently clicked here uh, and the coffee flowing down into the cup. So this was uh, electronic retrofitting. What are the domain specific challenges? Well, first of all, uh, you have to establish measurability of the signals you want to measure and that requires specialized hardware. You can either use an oscilloscope, which is uh, good, but at the same time, difficult to manage in the time domain, which is why we use the logic analyzer, uh, which allows us to just record everything on the computer and then even in theory, analyze the protocols that run there. But in our case, that was just electrical signals from the buttons themselves. Um, reverse engineering in this domain, when timings are short, and everything has to be done manually because there's no standardized protocol running over the wire, requires patience and precision. Um, signal reproducibility can be difficult because uh, logic analyzer, uh, sorry, because the microcontrollers might, be, may, might not be able to uh, put out analog uh, voltages uh, according to the specifications of the machine. So you might even need more components. Um, and also the solution you get from retrofitting such a coffee machine is also very specific to the appliance or to its model at least. And for case study three, um, we looked at digital IoT retrofitting and there we are extending the work by uh, Michael Yirko, uh, who published this online as a sort of project diary uh, with very high detail. 
Uh, and digital retrofitting is done on serial ports or wireless ports or just on APIs. So appropriating uh, some sort of interface, some sort of digital interface for the own use case and attaching it or connecting it to the internet in order to have an IoT device. The target for this project is a soundbar speaker. And the motivation is to add features, namely uh, remote control via network and delay its obsolescence, of course. Um, I'm just going to gloss over this one because we're already pretty advanced in time. Um, but uh, yeah, I think you, you'll you still understand because this is probably closest to you as computer scientists. Um, first of all, when you do that, you have to identify the interface you're working with. It, uh, with. Uh, in the case of this, uh, this sound bar, um, the identification was not that easy because it's Bluetooth enabled, but uh, no one would expect the device that ca comes out or ca came out in 2020 to still be using Bluetooth Classic, which is just a serial port over Bluetooth. Um, so identifying the interface might be a challenge or at least a first step that you need to, you need to consider. Afterwards, you have to intercept the communication. Uh, for that, you use Wireshark, uh, which is a very nice uh, software tool to protocol every network traffic you have. Um, once that is done, you can use your brain to reverse engineer the protocol, meaning you probably have an app where you measured, where you recorded all your data. And you also have to record when you push a button on the app in order to set the input to HDMI or maybe uh, set the input to analog, so whatever. Then you get those bytes. And once you know what those bytes mean, um, you can build your own custom software solution. Uh, in this case, this is also, again, uh, an HTTP server, uh, which allows for a complex uh, software prototype for any platform, depending on the programming language uh, it's written in. In this case, it was written in Ruby, um, and it was controllable via HTTP. And that means once that is achieved and the uh, Raspberry Pi or whatever platform it runs on is connected to a network, it is more or less an Internet of Things device uh, and hasn't been before. So what are the challenges uh, with digital retrofitting? Well, first of all, uh, you have to intercept the communication. And for that, it's necessary that the product you, are want, you want to retrofit uh, adheres to communication standards and to documented communication standards. And for some of the protocols that are in use, you need compatible hardware, which is generally rather easy to come by. Um, you need to reverse engineer the protocol, which can be hard and can be mostly impossible when the protocols are encrypted. And at least you need specialized skills to do that because it's well not necessarily easy to pass those inputs and calculate the parity bytes uh, or the, the check checksum bytes. Uh, and also here, while the result is rather generic, uh, usually the solutions of such projects are not generic because the own use cases get prior prioritized. Um, and there's a lack of standardization for how IoT interfaces uh, can look like in order to be well used by each and every application. So the takeaways from these uh, from these case studies in the retrofitting uh, in IoT retrofitting in different domains is that it often requires specialized hardware and skills, and that for the physical domain you need uh, cross-domain thinking. You need different products like sensors and actuators. In the electronic domain, you always need specialized hardware and, uh, and hardware that can also reproduce the signal that you're measuring. And in the digital domain, you're more or less dependent on the readability of the protocols and on adherence to standards. But there's one global challenge that unites all of these, uh, all of these domains, which is that solutions uh, lack genericity. So whatever we build, it is hardly ever generic and generically usable for everyone and every use case. Okay, so we established IoT retrofitting of legacy hardware is challenging, but what about current IoT devices? Well, you see the situation is dire here, uh, but we want to propose an alternative, which brings me to the next topic to serial IoT or serial IoT, an interface for upgradability by default. And I had the honor to present uh, the corresponding paper uh, to CRIOT uh, at the International Conference of, on the Internet of Things last November in Nagoya in Japan. Um, but well, first to start to kick this off, uh, I need to open up the problem space once more, uh, this time for the current generation of IoT devices. As I said, the corresponding paper will be available in the ACMDL soon, I hope. Uh, I'm eagerly awaiting that, the yeah, publishing of the paper. Um, if So this image is supposed to represent 
how manufacturers envision your smart home. There's a lot of things on the on the left side, left hand side here. Some of those thi uh, those uh, things require a gateway to connect to you to the user with your smartphone. Some of those uh, require cloud connection to connect to your smartphone, and some might use the cloud uh, in specific scenarios. And some connect directly to your to your smartphone. Um, usually, uh, this is not where smart homes end because uh, users are dissatisfied uh, and put in place what we call a mediator middleware, which does mediate between all those different protocols, those different standards, uh, and provides you as a user with just one single app to control all of your things in, in your smart home. What we've observed in literature, in scientific literature, academic literature, is uh, that things have become more complex and there's now even meta mediators that mediate the mediators, um, which is, getting out of hand is what I said, uh, and brings me to problem one. There is a growing complexity of IoT systems, so they get too complex to manage as a regular user, especially in the smart home. Um, all right, let's go back to the basic uh, deployment that many of us maybe have at home. I do uh, mediator middleware, popular mediator middleware is the home assistant software that I've talked about earlier. Um, let's look still at this scenario. Um, what could happen or what happens from time to time, I don't know whether you've noticed or whether you've uh, not noticed, but whether it came to your attention that last summer, uh, the e-bike producer Van Move uh, went out of business and uh, there was on the horizon the threat of all the e-bikes becoming essentially non-motorized e-bikes or not even bikes anymore because you were unable to unlock them without receiving a fresh key from the cloud service that is attached to those e-bikes. So what happens if the cloud goes uh, maybe the manufacturer goes out of business or just decides to quit uh, supplying the service. Your thing is now essentially a paperweight. Uh, you are very unhappy because you paid for this. And problem two is growing dependence of IoT systems on manufacturer cloud service services. So uh, we as users, as consumers, are very dependent on cloud operators to keep their services uh, up to the standard and to the quality we want to use them with. And lastly, there's always this guy, or this manufacturer, this vendor that does nothing to integrate with any middleware and requires you to use their own app. And it's always to be used via their cloud service. And for me, this is dissatisfying. Uh, and also there's a growing fragmentation of IoT systems in this regard. So if we look at the conventional thing in the Internet of Thing, we can see tight integration. So everything is tightly packed together, uh, the sensor, the LEDs, uh, the LEDs, relays, motors, or security, also communication modules and services are packed tightly together into this one thing we call thing. But uh, if we bend our understanding and try to categorize the different components in such a thing, um, we, might, uh, well, we might reach a separation of concerns between two rather different parts of the machine, of the thing, the physical, and the digital capabilities of the machine. Um, or the way I like to uh, yeah, uh, the way I like to interpret them, the immutable and the dynamic properties of a thing. And those, in my opinion, can be separated. And uh, in between there, there still needs to be some sort of communication. And this is why we are introducing, or we were introducing Serial IoT or Serial IoT. Uh, our protocol that uh, supports upgradability by default. So uh, this is an overview of our design. Um, the state of the art is, of course, that the typically IoT appliance is integrated very tightly. The network interface is integrated and it's not removable and not at all exchangeable. Um, our design is uh, well aimed at retrofitting and also at, at upgradability, which means we developed a framework that allows for device adaptation uh, to different appliances, and on the other hand, provides the Sierra IoT interface, which can then be interfaced with a client, for example, a network adapter, but also a different user interface, if you will. And we have an, implementa we have an implementation going, uh, which consists of an espresso maker that you've seen earlier uh, with its implant and also with a client attached to it.
Um, we developed the physical protocol, which is just the simple low voltage, ser voltage serial port based on uh, universal asynchronous receiver transmitter on UART. On the right hand side here, you can see uh, my flipper zero, which is connected uh, to the appliance and awaiting uh, awaiting a command to send to the uh, to send to the CRIOT interface. This is beneficial because it's supported by many microcontrollers and other hardware, and you can also interface with it from a PC with a simple adapter. Um, a connector, like a physical connector, would need to be standardized in the future. Uh, yeah, it provides high compatibility and has readily available hardware. We also developed a logical protocol, which is SC-based and human-readable. It's just a JSON. Um, you send a start command to the CRIOT interface, and you get back the device description, um, which tells you exactly what the device can do. So you as a developer, so entering the developer's perspective, you as a developer can just request the information about the device and then develop your own application, your own service, your own user interface for uh, the thing you are going to uh, use. Um, Anything you need to operate the interface is provided by the interface itself, so you can't lose documentation. And uh, with this, client devices can always be developed anew, so you can always uh, create new clients. Um, also, we have a data model with it, which is just based on the Web of Things things description. So the Web of Things is an interoperability initiative, uh, which uh, tries to make the IoT interoper interoperable through web technologies. Uh, and for us, the things description is interesting because it just separates the thing into actions, into properties and events. This is simple, this is comprehensible, and it allows potential for integration with Web of Things technologies. And in the end, no, not in the end, but we also need the device adaptation layer, uh, which is just the code that you need to access the device. This is just the code that reproduces the electrical signals in our coffee maker. We package those into callable functions, and those can be mapped to the framework uh, with a little bit of glue code. Uh, and then, uh, in essence, this device adaptation layer code is interchangeable. So you can integrate almost any Arduino compatible retrofitting project with the SER IoT framework if you need to. Uh, and we also have a client which connects to the SER IoT interface. It can be anything that speaks UART. Uh, you can create another alternative physical user interface for accessibility. You can use any communication standard. Uh, you just need to map the device description from CRIOT uh, to your own communication-oriented data model. And what that enables us is consumers, or is, what that enables is for consumers to select service providers and communication technologies themselves, whatever they want to use. And also the manufacturer bankruptcy scenario is completely sidestepped because as a consumer, I can just pull the plug of the current service provider, throw it away and, well, stick another plugin, or maybe just flash new software to the plug. This is our implementation. You've already seen this in part. Um, we have a framework in Arduino C++ with a little bit of glue code and the pre-existing device-specific Dell code from the retrofit project earlier. And we have a client device with Wi-Fi, which is configurable uh, via a Wi-Fi hotspot and uses MQTT as transport protocol and uh, Home Assistant MQTT auto discovery, which means it's generic and we can plug this client device into any interface that serves CRIOT, and it will show up in our Home Assistant instance as a new interactable device. Um, we also evaluated this prototype, and it's just a proof of concept, so we are very happy that we could successfully establish the communication between the Home Assistant and the device adaptation layer code. And also, uh, the memory and storage consumption was a little bit lower compared to the full retrofit code, which also had libraries for the HTTP server included. Um, but this is just a side note. What are the takeaways? Oh, I'm seeing I'm short on time already. Um, CRIOT provides us with upgradability by default through its human readability and its self-description. Uh, it's very basic protocols. It's very basic data model. It's very accessible interface. It's retrofit friendly because the framework is open source and it is designed to incorporate foreign code. And uh, CRIOT, in theory, would enable competition for IoT services because open local interfaces would allow for the development of novel services, novel adapters, and novel uh, user interfaces. Okay, I'm going to maybe take a little bit more of your time because going forward is also very important um, towards a right to improve. Uh, I want to bring you back to the beginning, more or less the beginning, uh, and I wanted you I wanted you to remember the legal framework in the European Union. 
So we had the eco design directive, the sale of goods directive, and the right to repair. Uh, what about the uh, legal framework in the European Union? Well, it completely misses the Internet of Things. Because in between the, well, the sale of goods directive no longer uh, being in effect for you and the device physically failing, there's a lot of potential for dissatisfaction or for cloud failure. Uh, and if we bring back the bathtub curve for the IoT, this might not be such a comfortable bathtub anymore because you maybe get delivered with bugged updates with render your devices inoperable for a time that might be even for a short time. Also, uh, the cloud service might go offline and you're just getting half of the functionality of your product. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a big, big old gap there uh, from our perspective, which is uh, why we developed our vision uh, of a right to improve and went back to not the drawing board, but back to literature uh, and did a systematic review of academic literature in which we screened over 400 sources in the ACMDL and in the IEEE Explore and analyzed over 80 sources in depth, so research papers, uh, and scoured them for arguments supporting a right to improve. And what we found is that there's enough evidence for the technical feasibility of creating, uh, or for the technical feasibility of a right to improve. Uh, first of all, the case studies we conducted and also CRIOT are sort of evidence for that. And also there's a lot of documented literature on especially industrial IoT retrofitting. And also we found literature that supports uh, our claim that user desire, users desire uh, an open internet of things and users have the active wish to compose smart home devices or that current smart home systems fail to address their specific uh, use cases or specific needs. And lastly, uh, how could uh, such a right to improve look like if we envision it? Um, we have two ideas, which is first, it could be a manufacturer obligation, just like the Eco Design Directive. That means uh, just a mandate of an interface for novel IoT applications to interact with, um, which would then probably be uh, specified by some sort of uh, gremium. <laughs> uh, and you could compare this to the USB charging interface uh, for mobile phones, which has recently been finally uh, enacted with uh, the iPhone 15 coming with a standardized uh, global, uh, coming globally with a USB-C uh, charging port. Or the other vision we, we have is that it could be a consumer right, which would then more or less be analogous to the right to repair, which is more a consumer entitlement to an accessible interface, which would leave manufacturers with more freedom in design, of course, but also the abstraction would leave the scope open. So this would not necessarily need to apply to IoT only. So we could envision a more complex or more, more open right to improve that uh, generally allows uh, improving all kinds of appliances uh, because there needs to be documentation and there needs to be interfaces and standards. Okay. So uh, concluding for uh, today, uh, you've heard about the sustainable development goal number 12 and on few of the aspects the European Union hopes to further this goal. Uh, I think we as computer scientists can act beyond that. Um, I told you about product obsolescence and the bathtub curve. Uh, no thing lasts forever, unfortunately. Um, we looked at retrofitting IoT capabilities. Uh, adding features is already possible, but it's challenging. Um, I showed you CRIOT, our recent project, uh, which is an alternative technological path to this problem. And also I showed you a vision uh, to the right to improve, with, which uh, is founded in a systematic review of academic literature. And it's also to appear in uh, Frontiers in the Internet of Things, which is a, a journal, uh, and it's currently under, under review there. And in the end, I just want to express special thanks to a few of my colleagues who helped make this possible. Uh, the highest thanks go to Dr. Albert Raffetzeder, which is a postdoc at our facility, at our research group, um, uh, who helped a lot. And to Raphael Ornitzmüller and Harry Fesenmeyer for doing uh, the implementation work in all of these uh, projects. And the CRIOT framework is available as open source software on GitHub. So if you want to, please check it out, uh, give feedback, uh, 
make your own projects and tell me about how it worked or maybe fix it if it's broken. <laughs> and with that, I uh, thank you for your attention and uh, want to open the floor for the discussion, uh, which is, I think, uh, yeah. we have a few more minutes, I think. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, okay, there are, I guess you can read yourself the question. The chat question, the, yes. In the chat, yeah, I don't have to. Uh, we did not. Uh, so, okay, first question, non-serious question. Did you implement the hypertext coffee pot protocol for your coffee machine? No, we did not. We also did not uh, send the I'm a teapot. Oh, okay, it doesn't really apply to the coffee machine uh, status code. Um, this was just a very quick and dirty implementation to get anything working, and then we wanted to proceed beyond that. Serious question. What is the target market of CRIOT, academic, uh, POC? Proof of concept. Proof, Proof of concept, concept yes. Uh, or project exclusively or after, for aftermarket or try to get vendors on board. So ideally, I'd love for vendors to be on board. But I know that this is right now an academic proof of concept. I'm a, I'm a yeah, pre-doctoral researcher and I'm almost done with my dissertation project. Um, so we'll see where it goes. Uh, I'm going to need to put food on my table and I don't think CRIOT is going to do that for me. So if anyone wants to take over, uh, please feel welcome. Um, but uh, right now, this will probably remain an academic proof of concept. But yeah, vendors would be great. And I think CRIOT, the implementation is not even the most important part of it because it's just uh, how we did it. The most important part of it is the concept of uh, separating the concerns. This is the main idea. We have immutable and we have very st we have yeah static immutable properties of devices and we have dynamic properties of devices which can change software is so malleable and uh, there's no sense in locking that down and in tightly integrating that into something that is going to be in use for 10 to 20 years at least in my opinion um i think i don't again the presentation presentation was really great. Uh, it, it's unbelievable, unbelievable what we as computer scientists can do to the various, on a te technical level even, to the various sustainability goals. Um, why, how, why did you choose this um, research target? Oh, that's interesting. So, um... Uh, I, I'm always, uh, so I was always personally dissatisfied uh, with the way I could interact with uh, appliances that I have at home. And I, when I bought stuff, I always imagined things to be able to do more than they were actually able to do. <laughs> because in theory, they should be able to, they could. Uh, but there's yeah maybe an artificial or by design, just a lockdown of features that are not enabled. So I always wanted to make things do more than they are supposed to do. Um, and then uh, I think, yeah, I, I, I had a nightmare one night, <laughs> which gave me, uh, which, which triggered me for the, for the retrofitting part of it, or gave me the name. And uh, well, I thought maybe it's worth, it's worth pursuing uh, this from an academic view and uh, trying to find out what do you really do when you try to extend the feature set of an appliance. Uh, most of this is implicit knowledge, right? We have engineers that can build, that can work on stuff, but very few of it is documented from the academic perspective. And that's what uh, we tried to do. And then also we thought, why not propose on how to make it better, how to do it better? Very interesting. Um, I just check if there are more questions in the chat in which way the software obsolescence could be proven if that it is possible i'm not sure i understand exactly what you want to ask could you maybe add more precision to your question so oh plant yeah 
of course, it's very hard to detect whether obsolescence is planned. Um, then there would need to be a very, very clearly detectable pattern, of course. And also this pattern can, could also just be bad design, not uh, not voluntarily uh, bad design. So uh, the, the design paradigm uh, of making every part last as long as the weakest part uh, was very new to me when I did my research, but it makes sense in a way because as I've said, nothing can be built to last forever. And you have to, you have to still, from an ethical standpoint, be mindful of the resources you use when producing a product. So uh, it is, in fact, I think, yeah, not a bad idea to reduce the amount of resources you use uh, in order to make a product as a whole last for a specific time, uh, instead of over-engineering specific parts. Um, I don't know how I arrived here, but planned obsolescence, um, yeah, is I think very hard to detect unless it's documented within um, within the the goals or within internal communication of uh, of a company where they where they explicitly say we want to make this last for a specific time. Yeah, I heard about that, but I haven't seen it yet. That was this year the CCC talk, correct? Where they where they reverse engineered the trains in order to fix them, and then the manufacturer got very angry about that. <laughs> yes, I'll have to look at that. Thank you very much. Um, whether it's possible to find out of the software obsolescence in code, for example. So I think software obsolescence in code is not really necessarily really intentional, and especially with the IoT, software obsolescence can come in different forms. Uh, First of all, of course, no longer updates, no longer being delivered, and also um, just loss of communication. So I don't even need to put the kill switch in the code of the product if I have the kill switch in the cloud and I can just switch off the service and then the product is a paperweight. So um, there's no need to put that in software. Otherwise, of course, you can try to read software out of the flash on microcontrollers and try to find the bytes that are responsible for the thing breaking after 20,000 iterations, but uh, that's uh, hard to do. And maybe it's also some sort of statistical, uh, maybe there's also some sort of statistics uh, yeah, included in the process, which determine when the product will fail. So I think it's definitely hard to detect and you need, uh, so the retrofitting and reverse engineering we did was on very rather readily available uh, data. Uh, and not really obfuscated data, which would be the specific prog program code on on an IoT device. Right, any more questions? Um, I guess you have answered all the questions. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you very much for this really interesting talk. And it's, it's amazing how kind of, uh, you know, different and complementary the different talks are. And, I, 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 you know, I was you know, 40 years ago, I started at uh, University of Vienna. And yeah. of course, you haven't been born there at that time, but I didn't know that uh, I kind of your research group, and it is really very interesting to see how uh, you know how things evolved and and uh, which kind of uh, research is done at uh, University of Vienna. Great. We're doing weird uh, applied computer science here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> great. <laughs> this is why we are at the university. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, how to think and to try out things. Yeah, otherwise we would uh, stay in the industry. And then try Thank to you. mold it into a dissertation. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you will. You will do a great dissertation. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much again for your presentation. We have one more next week. Thank you to the audience. Yeah, again for, um, you know being interested in our lecture series and um, also putting up all the questions and kind of being sustainable the whole semester. So we see each other next week and thank you very much again. Goodbye.
Thank you and goodbye.